Hi everybody, welcome to our vodcast on cellular respiration. Now cellular respiration is a process that's important because it provides our body with energy so we can do multiple things throughout the day. So for example, if we take a look at our CrossFit box or CrossFit gym here, we see three individuals doing three different things. This gentleman on the right, he was kind of sitting down, talking, stretching, moving around, warming up, getting ready for his workout. So cell respiration is providing his body the energy it needs to do that. Second of all, we in the back, we have this young lady here doing Russian kettlebell swings and cell respiration is allowing her muscles to contract, to pull that kettlebell up, to allow her heart to contract and beat and, and push out blood all over her body so she get oxygen everywhere. And then here in the foreground, we have this young man who's collapsed on the floor because he's pushed his body to the limits of cell respiration to get this workout done as fast as he can so he can feel as wonderful as he feels right now. So let's take a look at how cell respiration works. Now cell respiration can be broken up or de described in two different ways. We have what's called aerobic respiration and we have anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is the process in which we use oxygen to make energy. Anaerobic respiration is the process in which we don't use oxygen to make energy and our body uses both actually and we'll touch on that in our next vodcast in this vodcast we're, go we're going to talk about aerobic respiration so first of all when you see a chemical reaction like this and there's atp or energy at the end of it this is always going to be a respiration reaction so that's the first thing you should always look for when trying to identify a respiration reaction second of all to tell the difference whether it's aerobic or not you look for the oxygen in the left part of the reaction, on the reactant side, we have oxygen here, thus it makes this reaction aerobic. Let's take a look at what we have in this reaction. First of all, you need a glucose molecule, and that's what we get from our food, it's the sugar that our body uses for fuel to make this energy. Then we get six molecules of oxygen that we breathe in from the atmosphere. The arrow represents the process of cell respiration and everything that goes on, and then we have products that include six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. We breathe both of them out, so you'll see the water when you breathe out on a cold day and that fog comes out of your mouth, and we always breathe out carbon dioxide, which is invisible. But we do this so we can make this energy back here, and this is ATP energy. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and these are the little fuel cells that our body runs on to do everything that you do every day of your entire life. And this reaction is pretty efficient and it produces a max of 38 ATP, but it can range based on the ATP demands for the reaction itself. When we take a look at cellular respiration, cell respiration occurs in two places. One, it occurs in the cytoplasm, part of it does. And then second of all, most of it occurs in this bean-shaped organelle called the mitochondria. And we learned about that when we talked about cell organelles in our previous lessons. So let's go back out to the cytoplasm and talk about the first process here. The first process is called glycolysis. Now, if you remember from our previous lessons, we spoke about what lysis means in, with lysosomes, and we also spoke about it when we talked about hydrolysis. Lysis means to split, and glyco means glucose. So this process here really literally means splitting glucose. So let's take a look at what happens. Now, glucose is a six carbon molecule. So that's what each one of these spheres represents, a carbon. So there's six of them, six carbons. Now we have to split it. So to split it, we have to get rid of these hydrogens in the glucose. And that is the name of the game of cell respiration, it is to take all the hydrogens or as many hydrogens as we can out of the glucose and get it into the electron transport chain, the third part of this whole series. So hydrogens are important because if you take a look, a hydrogen is going to carry an electron, and then when that electron is taken away, it will have a positive charge, which is what we then need at the end to produce our ATP. So we have these transport carriers called NAD+, plus that are floating out in the cytoplasm, and these are like the UPS delivery trucks. They're going to go over by glycolysis and during this reaction pick up hydrogen atoms. So NAD plus is going to turn into NADH. There's that hydrogen atom from the glucose that it took, and in this instance, it took two of them. So it's going to take those two hydrogen atoms with the electrons that it's carrying and move them all the way into the mitochondria to the electron transport chain. Once this happens, 
our pyruvic acid is going to be formed. And during this reaction, we actually create 2 ATP out of the 38. So we make a little bit of energy here. Now, our pyruvic acid is then going to react with another NAD plus molecule. So again, we have another delivery truck waiting for a package. It reacts with the pyruvate, and then it picks up the hydrogen atom package. So again, we have two hydrogens taken, we have two electrons taken, and this is going to carry the electrons into the electron transport chain. So again, we're taking more hydrogens out of the glucose. As a result of that, we actually lose a carbon and we start to create carbon dioxide right here. So this is where we start to make some of our waste. Because we lose a carbon, this pruvic acid is no longer pruvic acid, it becomes acetyl-CoA enzyme. Now acetyl-CoA enzyme, again, is gonna do the same thing that pyruvic acid was doing. It's just going to transport hydrogens into the mitochondria. So this whole process of glycolysis occurs outside of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Now let's go into the mitochondria. Acetyl-CoA will diffuse through the membrane and enter a process called Krebs cycle. So that's the second stage of cell respiration here. All that's gonna happen here is again, the transport of hydrogen atoms. So if we take a look, we have two transport molecules waiting. So two more pickup trucks waiting for deliveries. We have NAD plus and his buddy FAD plus. NAD is gonna pick up one hydrogen and FAD is a little bit more greedy. FAD likes to grab two hydrogens. So that's what they're going to do. So as you can see, more hydrogen atoms are being picked up, more electrons are being transported to the electron transport chain. You can see that in glycolysis, we have electrons moving down here, and in Krebs, we have electrons moving down here into the chain. As a result of this, we actually put out two more ATP molecules, so we have two ATP down there, and then we create more waste, and we create two molecules of carbon dioxide. So now we have three molecules of carbon dioxide, but if you take a look at the formula, it says that we're supposed to make six. So why isn't there six down here? Well, it's because we followed the path of one pyruvic acid. Remember, we made two. So the second pyruvic acid was going to produce three more carbon dioxide for a total of six. That is the glycolysis and Krebs cycle portion of aerobic respiration. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what happens in the electron transport chain. Now here's our diagram of the electron transport chain. And in order to understand how this chain works, we have to take a look at the basic anatomy of a mitochondria. So let's do that right now. So here's our mitochondria. And if we take a look, we could see that it has different structures here. So first of all, we have the, what's called the outer membrane. The outer membrane is just the outer shell of the mitochondria itself. So it's cleverly called the outer membrane. On the inside of the mitochondria, we have another membrane, which is also cleverly called the inner membrane. And the inner membrane is the part that gives the mitochondria its folded appearance on the inside. On the other side of the inner membrane, we have what's called the matrix. And the matrix is essentially the, the inner part of the mitochondria. So when we take a look at our diagram here, here we have our inner mitochondrial membrane. So it's this pink folded membrane that runs through the mitochondria. On top of this or above it, we have what's called the intermembrane space. This intermembrane space is simply the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And then below that, we have our mitochondrial matrix, the stuff on the inside or the area inside of the inner membrane. So it's essentially as if we tilted this over on its side, so we're looking at it directly, and that's what this diagram is showing us. Now, this is how the electron transport chain works. Remember earlier when we were talking about our friends NAD and FAD. There are our electron transports that were bringing hydrogen atoms back to the electron transport chain because the hydrogens have electrons that need to go to the electron transport chain. So what happens is this. Our electron transport chain is composed of different proteins that are embedded in the inner membrane. When NAD reacts with that protein, it's going to drop off an electron. And in addition, FAD is going to react with the electron transport chain, and it's going to drop off its two electrons. So NAD gets rid of one, and FAD gets rid of its one or two, however many it's carrying. So when we see that happen, what happens then is this. This hydrogen breaks off of NAD, and NAD becomes NAD plus now. And this molecule is then going to scurry on back to the Krebs cycle and go get more hydrogen electrons. FAD does the same. Since FAD lost both of its hydrogens over here, 
okay, fad becomes fad plus, and it's going to go back out to the Krebs cycle. So now here we have our hydrogen ions that were brought in by these two transport molecules. What happens next is we have the transport of the electrons moving through the chain. So these molecules, or these electrons rather, as they move through the chain, what they're going to do is they are actually going to power and give energy for these, for these hydrogen ions to leave the matrix because we're going against the concentration gradient, as I'll show you in a moment. As the energy gets passed on, our hydrogen ions are going to leave and go out of the matrix and into the space between the outer membrane and inner membrane. When you take a look at that, you'll see that we have a lot more hydrogen ions out here compared to the number of hydrogen ions in the matrix. So we now have a concentration gradient. We have an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration. And as we know, by the rules of diffusion and transport, things like to go from high to low. However, these guys are trapped in between the space and they can't leave through the outer membrane and they can't get through at least the actual walls, the lipids, the phospholipids of the inner membrane. But there are transport proteins that are built in. So these transport proteins are going to allow this high concentration of hydrogen ions to diffuse and pass through back into the cell. When it diffuses and passes back into the cell, these hydrogen ions are going to react with ADP, adenosine diphosphate. It's essentially a molecule with two phosphates on the tails. This is basically a relative of ATP because what's going to happen next is this hydrogen ion is going to react with ADP and then create ATP over here. It's going to add the third phosphate that it needs to create our energy molecule. ATP is done, it's created, and it's ready to go, and it moves off to be used by something else. So this is how our energy is made. So we've now accounted for our ATP energy up here, we've accounted for the glucose in the beginning, and we've accounted for how carbon dioxide is made, but we haven't accounted for how water and oxygen are being used or produced. And that brings us back to our electron transport chain. As these electrons move through the transport chain, what will happen is they'll come back into the matrix. So this is where the oxygen comes into play. You breathe in the six molecules of oxygen so they can act as what we call an electron acceptor. So these electrons are going to then bond to the oxygen. Now that the oxygen has extra electrons and has a negative charge, we have these free-floating hydrogens that are missing electrons because they have a positive charge, and they're going to then bond with the oxygen. When you have the hydrogens bond with the oxygen, you're going to have two hydrogens bond with one oxygen, which gives us H2O, and that H2O is our waste product up here. So we need our oxygen in order to make our waste product water, and that's aerobic respiration. And that's how your body makes ATP. Thank you for your time.